In our sermon series in Luke, we are coming to the stage in the Gospel just prior to Jesus entering into Jerusalem. Luke has been dropping hints that the narrative is beginning to move forward as Jesus comes to Jerusalem for the final time in order to be crucified. And there's still bits of teaching that we need to look at as part of Jesus' teaching ministry, and Luke records the final bits of teaching. And you might have noticed, if you've been with us over the last couple of years, that there are themes that Luke has chosen to pick out in what Jesus is teaching that have come up again and again, different areas, different ideas, that the Lord has talked about coming from one angle, and then he's talked about it coming from a slightly different angle. And he's repeated himself and told different parables to try and get across the core themes of what it is he's trying to train first his disciples and then us. Clearly this means we need things explained to us. I think we all know we need things explained to us multiple times. We need that repetition. We need things from different angles. And as we come to the end, we are getting parables and bits of teaching that remind and conclude Jesus' thoughts on certain subjects. As we began chapter 18, we came back to Jesus talking about prayer once again. And you remember that Jesus chose to tell us a parable, and Luke chose at this point, late in the parable, to start explaining exactly why Jesus is giving us the parable. This is without any doubt, faith. This is let's make everything absolutely clear before we get to the end of the gospel, what Jesus has been saying. In order to ground these points home, we looked last week at Jesus' return to the theme of children and welcoming children and how we need to be like little children. And before we get to Jerusalem, over the next few weeks and months, we'll be returning to the theme of wealth. We'll be refer- returning to the theme of how we uh, prepare ourselves for heaven. And we'll also have one final healing uh, story. We're coming now this morning to a final occasion where Jesus is going to tackle the Pharisees one last time. And he's going to deal with this theme of self-righteousness. On this occasion... Pharisees aren't actually there, it doesn't seem, but they come up in the parable. So some of this will be familiar as we hit this thing one last time. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 18, uh, beginning in verse 9, page 824. He, that's Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortionate, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Praise God in the reading of his word. You will immediately notice, just like the parable of the persistent widow at the beginning of the chapter, that this is another parable where Luke tells us exactly what Jesus is telling us in the parable. Makes my task a bit easier this morning. Me 
means we won't need to spend as long figuring out the interpretation. What is this parable about? Verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So after all of Jesus' teaching on not trusting in yourself, not trusting in your own righteousness, not trusting in the things that you do, on always teaching on loving your neighbours and loving even your enemies, there are still some around and the disciples still need to hear this message that they mustn't be making this mistake, that they mustn't be trusting in themselves and their own sense of righteousness. We can see that Jesus clearly has Pharisees in mind, once again, and people who act like them because they feature in the parable to come. We've considered the heart problem laid out for us. In the story, the Pharisee is trusting in himself. He's trusting that by his own thinking and his own judgment, he is righteous. And that, those thoughts and that heart, that internal being, results in an outward behaviour. He then goes about bolstering his sense of righteousness by comparing himself to someone else who he perceives to be less righteous. And the behaviour we see on the surface is this outward verbal contempt towards someone he regards as being less righteous. So he's made the decision in his mind, I'm righteous according to my own understanding. In his heart, he's trusting in himself. He makes himself feel better by putting other people down. And he does so by doing it verbally. Christians boil this idea, this behaviour, down to what you might call self Righteousness. Self righteousness. I have made myself righteous in my own eyes. I have made myself righteous by comparing myself to others and I'm definitely better than them. I have made myself right in the eyes of my fellow men and women, my fellow brothers and sisters. They think I'm righteous, therefore I must be righteous. And if people who behave in this way believe in a deity, then they presume that their own self-assessment will be sufficient to twist God's arm and get into heaven. They think they'll be able to take all of this thinking and all of this contempt and take it to the doors of heaven on the last day and go, well, let me in. I am righteous because I have decided that I am. I don't know if you've ever had to fill out a self-assessment tax return. But it's like someone who fills out a self-assessment tax return, but rather than doing so according to the rules set out by HMRC, you declare on your tax form, I have paid the right amount of tax as far as I'm concerned. I have come up with my own rules for how much tax I should pay, and I have paid that amount. And I'm not going to pay any more than that. And in fact, I've looked at how much tax my competitors pay, and I'm paying more than them. So as far as I'm concerned, HMRC, this is the right amount of tax. That's the sort of attitude we're talking about, is self-assessment. There's nothing wrong with doing self-assessment tax return. There probably is something wrong with doing it and playing by your own rules, or thinking that because someone else may or may not be playing by the rules that you are therefore justified. Now, what I've said so far might be enough for some of us, but Luke seems to be employing a classic <coughs> method of communication. You might be familiar with it. You uh, tell someone what you're going to tell them, you uh, tell them what you tell them, and then you tell them what you've told them. And in Luke's gospel, that's what we've got here. Luke tells us what Jesus is going to tell us, Jesus is going to tell us what he's going to tell us, and then Jesus is going to summarise what he's told us. We're going to walk through that process this morning. So, I've told you what I'm going to tell you, and now we're going to look at the parable itself. We come and look at Jesus' summary at the end. So, coming back 
Acts of the parable, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all. Pharisees is using his prayer in the temple to convey to everyone else just how righteous he is. And he's doing so by putting down someone else who happens to be in the temple at that time. And he's doing so in a way that would have been recognizable to the Jewish people around him. The things he's referring to bear some similarity to the Jewish law. What he's saying is quite close to the rules of the Old Testament, although, as we'll see, it falls short. He claims that he doesn't extort money out of other people. Fair enough, I don't know how many of you spend your time extorting money out of other people. He claims to be a just man. He's not unjust like other men. Although, I think, as we'll see, I'm not sure he's being entirely fair to his brother in the temple. I'm not sure how just he He's not an adulterer, and he's not, worst of all, like the tax collector. We've seen the tax collector come up as a, as a character and as individuals throughout the Gospel of Luke. We've said before, tax collectors were considered the worst of the worst. And who do you think the worst people are in society? Is it the worst type of paedophiles? Is it terrorists? Whoever it is, in Israel at the time, it was those traitors who were working for the Roman oppressors, who turned their back on the Roman people and were helping oppress the Jewish people. And they were generally expected, as well as working for the Romans, which was the first crime, to be taking money for themselves and saying that the Romans have asked for this much money, but they're taking even more and pocketing some themselves. In that society at that time, they were on top of all that, having put down the tax collector, the Pharisee claims that he tithes twice, sorry, he um, fasts twice a week. Now, according to the Jewish law, you only really needed to fast, needed to fast once a year. But this chap has made a point of telling everyone else that he fasts twice a week. And then he tells us that he tithes. Absolutely everything. There's not a thing I don't tithe, praise this Pharisee. Whether it's the money he gets, or the grain, or the animals, or any other produce, he takes 10% of it and gives it to the Levites. He gives it to the church in a modern setting. And you'll realize immediately that it's very easy to pray these things. It's quite hard for anyone to verify if any of this is actually true. Jesus in Luke has already criticized the Pharisees straining out every single of the tithe, going beyond the law, every single herb and mint and dill, every single tiny thing, but failing to love their neighbour. He's made a big point about that. And because the Pharisees were tithing every little thing, but they weren't loving their neighbour, they were falling short of the law. They were falling short of God's righteousness. The Old Testament was really clear that you were to love but these men were doing the outward signs, but they were not loving their brothers and sisters. Just like this Pharisee in the parable is not really being very loving to his brother, the tax collector. We've read the Old Testament. Some of us have had that privilege. We know what the law requires. And we can see how someone's self-assessment <coughs> superficially or initially seem righteous. It's actually fundamentally flawed. We've been listening to Jesus' repeated assessment of the Pharisees, their behavior, and hopefully by now we're able to detect how they fall short of God's righteousness. Now you might think the prayer we've just read is a little bit ridiculous. You might have never heard anyone pray quite like this Pharisee. I can understand that. I'm not sure I've heard someone pray about how many times they're fasting. But there are ways that people say things in the same way that the Pharisees.
Pharisee does in our day. People still do behave in this way. I'm going to give you some examples. They are just examples. They're not my views. They're just some examples of what the ways in which people sometimes act like this. In the world, out there, in person or online, you might find someone saying something like this. Oh Lord, I'm glad I am not like the cisgender, white, patriarchal boomer man. I am not bigoted or racist. I have checked all my privilege. I am so thankful that I am more woke than anyone else, unlike the other haters in my generation. I'm so glad I trusted in the experts and am not taken in by the conspiracy theorists. I have never touched an animal product and I give to all good causes. In the modern day, this is referred to as virtue signal. Letting everyone else know just how virtuous just how righteous you are. You may be aware of these words. These words may make no sense to you at all, but this is how some people in the world talk. And in the world, in the supposed so-called culture war, there's another side of the argument. And on the other side of the argument, people make similar statements and they make the similar mistake. People say things like this. Oh God, I'm glad I'm not like these gender-confused foolish millennials. I am colorblind. I don't want to know about people's sexuality, thank you very much. I believe in equality of opportunity, not like these communists. I am thankful that I am anti-woke and that I have seen through the lies of the establishment and the mainstream media. I eat only meat and spurn all vegetables, and I save money to give an inheritance. say this whole debate might be unfamiliar to you but I can assure you that online and in TV punditry this is how things often play out. And it's not my job this morning to pick through the arguments and work out the rights and the wrongs of each phrase or point or statement. But my main point is these statements are representative of the way people talk in the world by their own standards in order to justify their own sense of self-righteousness. And they throw contempt on others. It's not about right or wrong. In the Pharisee, in the parable, the Pharisee might have been right about some of the things he said. He may well not have been an adulterer. It's not to say that we can't engage in some of these discussions or have opinions on these matters. But when we take our opinion and we project them loudly before others and we insert them into our prayers and we do so to denigrate other people, we're committing the same error as the Pharisee. Now you may be blissfully unaware of the things that I have referred to, but let me briefly give you some examples of how things often go in church life may have come across it. In a meeting of Christians from different churches, one man might stand up and say something like this. Oh God, I thank you that I am not like the liberal Christians. That I read my Bible with three commentaries by my side. That I worship in a proper church in the proper way. I am led by my mind and not by my heart. I am confessional and I have not been led astray by modern trends. I have the right theology. I understand all of God's ways. And then another gets up after this chap has finished and prays like this. Oh God, I thank you that I am not like these stuffy reformed Baptists. That I actually have a relationship with God. That I worship in an environment where people actually mean what they see. And that I have the very heart of God and I feel the way that he feels. I'm not stuck with the traditions, but I move with the Spirit. I have the right theology and understand all of God's ways. These are caricature, not to be taken too seriously, but they're not far from things that, if you spend a long time in church, you will hear people say or pray. Let me be honest, brothers and sisters, there will have been times and ways that I can think of, whether either in a worldly setting or in a church setting, where I've said, 
and make statements like this, where I've been so caught up in my own sense of being right about something, <laughs> that I've proclaimed it in a way to make myself look good in front of other people and to put down somebody else. In the church, false teaching needs to be challenged. Things need to be worked through. Conversations can be had. Brothers and sisters can disciple one another. But particularly in the context of the church, we must not speak about such important matters in a way that shows contempt for our brothers and sisters. We can work these things out privately. We can discuss where someone else might have gone wrong for their good try and help people figure things out. But we make a mistake when we take these arguments and we insert them into our public proclamations, into our prayers, and we make them make ourselves look good. When that's where our hearts are. When our hearts are, I want to make myself look good. I want to set myself apart from all these heathens in the church or in the world. That's where we go wrong, like the Pharisees. We make an assessment of our own righteousness and where we're make ourselves feel better by putting others down. The Lord forbid that we weaponize our prayers in this way. When we're supposed to be speaking to Almighty God and we use them to attack our brothers and sisters. When people are praying in church, I often have the role of overseeing that prayer time and I like to give people a lot of latitude and a lot of grace to say a lot of things. And sometimes I sit down and go, well, I'm not too sure about that. Space and grace for our brothers and sisters, and none of us quite pray rightly. The Spirit intercedes for us before the Father. But if people start recognizing their prayers to have a go at other people, that's something that will need to be gently challenged. That is one thing we really cannot be doing. It's dishonoring to God to use our prayers like that, it calms those around us. Poisons our prayer time, and every time a believer slips into praying like this, it's indicative that something has gone twisted in their hearts that needs dealing with. I'm not against people having strong convictions and strong views. In fact, it's quite a good thing to know what you believe and to be able to talk about what you believe in confidently and with confidence, even. But if we need to check our They have strayed into the wrong place. And even as I say these things, all of us, me included, need to be very careful that we are not quietly saying to ourselves, Oh Lord, I thank you that I never pray like Alex is talking about. I always have the most humble prayers, unlike those sinners. I've stretched out these examples to try and indicate how easy it is to fall into this way of thinking very tempting to then get self-righteous about the fact that we always pray rightly, if that's what we think we do. Now, our hearts are always coping us towards self-righteousness. It sort of speaks to our pride. Even mid-sentence we can slip into. Even when there's an opportunity to do the good work of proclaiming some truth or praying in the right way, the sin of speaking in a way that's contemptuous lies close to Such as we have been sanctified by God, so far as we have taught rightly, by the time we get to the end of our prayers, our right response would be to come back to God in the way that we looked at the other week and say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Let's focus for a moment on the prayer of the tax collector by contrast. But the tax collector, standing far off, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's a short prayer. This is the tax collector that the Pharisee presumed to be at fault. And as far as the tax collector is concerned, he is at some fault. He comes before God humble. He doesn't even have the heart to look up to God as he's praying. Something 
wrong with looking up to God as you're praying, but he can't even bring himself to do it. So ashamed. He's uh, beating his breast, which is not something people do in our culture. It's, it's not an act of defiance like the New Zealand rugby team with their hackers and their sort of thing. It's more of a, it's sort of borderline self harm. My chest is so heavy, I'm beating it, I feel awful about what I've done. I think we'll all have experienced moments of such guilt where our chest feels heavy. We have a man here who's so aware of his own sinfulness, so aware of his own lack of righteousness that he feels awful. And this causes him to beg God for mercy. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This parable is not to be teaching us that we need to avoid looking up when we're praying and that we need to beat our chest every time we pray. It's a very different prayer time if we do that quite painful. It is a model of repentance. It is a model of humility. It is a model of how we're to be, particularly when we first approach God. When we first get that sense of what we refer to as a conviction of sin, where the weight of our unrighteousness is brought home to us by the Spirit. When we realize how far we are from God's righteousness. As soon as we start talking about Self-righteousness and treating others with contempt, we can all then suddenly think of occasions where we failed in this area. Where we understand that we cannot make ourselves righteous before Almighty God, that we understand that we need the mercy of Almighty God. The next passage in Luke that we looked at last week talks about the importance of coming to God like a child. That we must come to God realizing that we have nothing to offer. That we are weak, that we cannot make ourselves righteous before him. Jesus says in a few verses time, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And Jesus concludes our parable this morning like this. I tell you, this man, tax collector, this man went down to his house justified. Rather than The Pharisee thinks he is righteous by his own standards, but he is not righteous before Almighty God. But the tax collector has received the mercy of Almighty God. As Jesus comes to Jerusalem, which if you were to just sit and read the rest of the chapter, it would take you ten minutes to finish the book of Luke. You would learn that Jesus died in our place. Not only that our, the weight of our sins could be removed, but so that we could receive the righteousness of God that we so desperately need. We've just spent two weeks, by the grace of God, talking to the children of Accrington about this great opportunity that they have to receive the righteousness of Christ through his death on the cross. If you realize this morning that you've spent your life making yourself look righteous in front of others, Make yourself feel better that you are unrighteous before Almighty God because Jesus has not yet died in your place. Because you have never come near him, you have never repented, you have never turned to him in humility. Then this is your opportunity to accept what Jesus has done. To trust in what Jesus has done. To turn to him in humility like the tax collector and receive the righteousness of God as the and if you do this, your place in the kingdom of heaven will be secure forever. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, if you pray like that, you will go down to wherever you live, justified before Almighty God. You will have your sins taken away. You will have been brought into his kingdom and into his family. And enabled. And this morning, Jesus then tells us what he's told us, and what he's told us before in the book of Luke. Jesus said at the end of our passage, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We 
we've gone before about the great reversal. What's going to happen? We've reflected for a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, on Judgment Day and what's going to happen in the end. Very similar to what Jesus said directly to the Pharisees. Bill read through us, Luke chapter 16, verse 14, where we read, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he, as Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You will remember that an abomination before God is anything that man to think that mankind treats us more important than God. And here, in this parable, we consider how men and women put themselves higher than God. They treat themselves like they're God. They treat themselves as if it's their job to make the decision, it's their job to choose themselves as righteous, and their job to condemn somebody else. God calls us to humility. All of us. There's not a Christian in this room who did not first come before God and was brought to his knees in humility. And having entered into that place on our knees at Jesus' feet like a little child, we are called to keep working out our salvation in fear and trembling. We are called to try and remain in that place of humility. The unbelievers here, you now know what you need to do. For believers, we must remember, come back to a place of humility. If we remember this morning ways when we've misstepped in this area, then we need to come back and ask for mercy, knowing that our sins have already been removed. We need to do this because this helps us see God properly and see ourselves properly. We need to do this because it helps us to pray in the right way. It enables us to talk to God in the right way, in the way of humility. We need to do this because it reminds us that our righteousness comes from God and not from ourselves. And we need to do this so that we're careful to treat our brothers and sisters in the church without contempt, without demeaning, without sisters, for this present age we are but a little lower than the angels, the scripture tells us. And that we have a promise that one day we will be raised up when Jesus returns. That we will be exalted under God. But for now we are the humble of this world. We are the weak of this world. That God might be shown to be mighty. That those around us who don't know Jesus might see that the only way that he Again, righteousness is from him, not from ourselves. That we might encourage our brothers and sisters, not put them down. Whatever the case this morning, we need to be in that place of humility. I need to be in that place of humility. To love our brothers and sisters and not show them contempt. To that end, I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to ask God for forgiveness, hopefully in a way that doesn't come across as self righteous or that isn't self righteous, more importantly. And I want you to pray with me. Uh, if you can, you can ask God, please, you need to ask God for forgiveness as well. Say, Amen at the end. Father God, all of us, before we knew you, trusted in ourselves. And many of us, since we come to know you, have made the mistake of starting to trust in ourselves again. Lord, that we seem to be righteous in our own eyes rather than your eyes. Lord, that we try to make ourselves look good in front of other people. Lord, that we put other people down. That we've treated them with contempt. Not lovingly, not trying to help. 
Lord, we probably got it in the church, but we might not have got it in the world. We haven't shown a picture of loving our neighbors and loving our enemies in all that we've said and all that we've done. Lord, forgive us. Lord, help us to come before you, to turn to you for fresh mercies that you promise us every day. Lord, we know we need you. We know that of ourselves we can do nothing but what you enable us to do by the power of your spirit. Lord, you are right. We thank you for what you have done on the cross. We thank you that you have taken our sins away. Lord, forgive us for every way that we have not walked in the light of the sin, the way that you have taken away our sin. And Lord, help us to remember as we consider our brothers and sisters that they're no different from us so far as they need to save you just as much as we do. Lord, help us to remain in a place of humility before you. Help us to become like little children and remain like little children in your presence. Help us to enjoy you.